Hey everyone, Pastor Grant here. We're so glad that you've made the decision to join us today. And uh, we're expectant that in this time together that we would experience the living God through the message that we're about to hear. We also hope that this resource, along with, with us being connected to a local church, would help us in taking our next steps with Jesus, whatever those may be. So let's be encouraged as we open the Bible today. The last six months, we've been asking the question, who is Jesus? Who is this man? And so for the next two weeks, I think it is a natural progression for us to ask the question, who, who are we? I think that that is an important question that we need to acknowledge. And when I say who are we, uh, I'm talking it has implications both personally and then also collectively. Who are we as Summit? And it can be easy when you refer to Summit to disassociate yourself from Summit, like Summit is some thing. No, I want you to do something with me. I want you just to look around you. Go ahead and be awkward. Make eye contact with the person you've been ignoring. Uh, This is Summit. We are Summit. Summit is not some ideology. It is not some theory. It is the people that we are following Jesus together with. And so for the next two weeks, we're going to talk through the vision, the mission, and the values of Summit. And, uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to tell you a story about these glasses, because that makes all the sense in the world. I'm going to tell you a story about a five-year-old standing on top of a refrigerator, and I'm going to tell you about cucumber vinegar salad because that, in my opinion, is the best way for me to communicate vision, mission, and values here at Summit. Uh, I think it goes without saying, however, uh, it goes without saying that vision is a very important thing. All of us, to varying degrees, would agree on that. Um, And when I say vision, I'm not talking about eyesight or optics. I'm talking about a vision of where we're going. We need to, as a people, we need to have some sense of of our destination, some sense of calibration as to where we are. And the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 29, uh, it it communicates that vision is, is a matter of life or death, actually. So according to scripture, a vision is a big deal. Uh, That scripture says that where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, where there is no divine revelation or prophetic vision, where God has not given his people a vision bigger than themselves, they just perish. It's a pretty ominous statement, really. So it really doubles down on how significant vision is. We need to know where we're going. We need to know where we are. And the vision of Summit is a really simple statement. You've heard it, you've seen it, you've experienced it to varying degrees. The vision of Summit is that we are in the city for the city. Would you say that with me? In the city for the city. Um, And that statement, it's unbelievably simple, correct? It's like, In the city for the city, got it. But the simplicity of that statement does not lack its reach. I I honestly think I could talk about the implications of in the city for the city and build a sermon series out over four to five years. And and I'm not just, that. not youth pastor Grant exaggerating. That's like real talk. In the city for the city, it has implications both on the, the now and the future. And uh, I told you I was going to talk about these glasses. Gosh, they're dirty. Um, I, I don't remember how, how long ago it was, but it was back in the day when uh, I would preach five times on a Sunday. That was just a typical Sunday. I would preach at 8, 9, 10, 11, and 5.30 p.m. It was a day. <laughs> like that, like... I was like, what is going on? Multiple times I would go home in between and I would just, I would sit on the couch and wake up at like 5.20 to my wife going, dude, you got to get back to the 5.30. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. 
call Nathan. Can you just show the video? He's like, no, get here. I'm like, okay. But uh, it was about the 11 o'clock service. So I had, it was my fourth time preaching. It was at this building. And uh, something really weird started happening. I was up here, I was preaching, and uh, my vision just started like, I, I could see the back row. Back row people, you're my people. Respect. I see you back there. You, right? When I go to church, I sit in the back. It's safe back there. Maybe. <laughs> but it was the craziest thing. I can see the in the city for the thing, uh, in the city for the city words on the back wall and the, the, the back row is really good. And my vision just started going blurry from the back of the room to the front. And it got so bad that I couldn't read my notes. It was freaky. Like, it would be weird to have happen, like, in your home, right? Like, I was standing, there's 700 people in this room, and my vision is just gone. And I'm like, good thing this is my fourth time preaching, because I have no, I'm flying blind right now. It was, it was really weird. So that week, I called the optometrist, and I was like, dude, I, I made an appointment. I go in. I'm like, hey, doc, here's the deal. This is what happened. He's like, okay, let's run some tests on your eyes and we'll go from there. He comes back in the room and he goes, well, you, you have very healthy eyes. Your eyes are in good shape and your vision is excellent. And I'm like, not helpful. <laughs> like, dude, I'm not, I'm not joking you. I couldn't see anything. And he was like, I, I hear you. And let me explain what I think is going on. You said you're preaching and you move between looking at people and your notes very frequently. And I was like, yep, that's it. And he goes, I think what's happening is you're bouncing between nearsighted and farsighted so much over a four hour period of time that your eyes actually just got tired and said they were done. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'll buy that. And I'm like, so what can you do, doc? And he's like, I think I could write you a prescription. And I said, here's the deal. I cut him off. It's so stupid that I'm going to educate a doctor. <laughs> He's like, dude, I'm like, let me tell you what you're going to do, bud. And I'm like, how about you write me a prescription that if it ever happens again, I, I can at least see my notes. And he was like, deal. And he's like, how come you'd rather see your notes instead of the people? <laughs> I was like, don't pastor me, eye doctor. <laughs> Get out, you just do the thing I asked you to do. <laughs> so these are like, these glasses aren't much, but they're just like, that happens from time to time. And they're like, almost like a little pacifier that just is like, hey, I might not be able to see everyone, but I cannot lose this. And similarly to my eyes preaching, that statement in the city for the city, it's nearsighted and farsighted. It's now sighted and future sighted. And I want to just talk about that for a moment. You and I are, are in the city of Spokane. And that vision statement has implications on the now. Far too often we disdain the places we live. And we believe a theme that is visible throughout scripture is that the people of God are called to actually be in the cities that they're in on purpose and for a purpose. You might feel like you're stuck in Spokane, but I want to remind you that you are not stuck, you are planted here. God has positioned you in this city for a very specific reason. And there's a, in, there's a moment in the, in the history of the people of God where they were, they were displaced they were brought out of their homeland and they were displaced in exile in Babylon. And God spoke very clearly to his people while they were in exile as to how they were to go about life in exile. And I wanna just let it be known that you and I uh, are in exile. <laughs> Whether you've lived for, in Spokane for dozens of years or not, what I mean by saying we're in exile is that this isn't the promised land. This city is broken. This city is godless to varying degrees. 
This is exile. Uh, to, to put it in the words of the great theologian, uh, the Wizard of Oz, you aren't in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. We are, not in, we are in a post-Christian society. It is not just like, oh, you follow Jesus? Okay. It's like actively opposed. <laughs> you and I are the away team is what I'm saying to you. You aren't the home team. And it's important that we understand how God has called his people in, in history to respond when they're not the home team. And it's in, it's in the book of Jeremiah. And I want to read to you what God spoke through his prophet, Jeremiah. He said this, this is what you do when you're in exile, when you're not the home team. You build homes and you plan to stay. You plant gardens and eat the food they produce. You marry and have children. They find spou- then find spouses for them so that they may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Good job, Cameron and Victoria. Do not dwindle away. You're living into it. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. That's fascinating. Seek the peace and the prosperity where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for the city, for its welfare will determine your welfare. Fascinating to me that God did not call his people to run, to get out of Babylon as quickly as possible, or to be angry, disgruntled people. He also didn't call them to be a spiritual country club that hides out and is reclusive. He instructed them to be what I would refer to as dangerously good people. Has anybody ever called you to do that? Be a dangerously good person in Spokane. Seek the prosperity and the peace of this city. Own this thing. Serve this place and the people that call it home. Spokane is home in the meantime for us. This is where we are planted. And maybe you're in college and you're passing through. What are you doing while you're here is what I would challenge you with. Maybe there's the prospect of moving somewhere else. That's great. I would call you to end well here while you're here. We are a group of ordinary people that exist to serve, care for, and love this city and those that we share it with. That's what it means from a nearsighted perspective to be in the city for the city. Now I want to talk about the long range the future-oriented, the long-sightedness of that vision statement. There is a restless longing in all of us for a truer home. Spokane is home for now. And I'm not talking about moving to Palm Springs or Hawaii or somewhere warm. There's that like stretch of time where we're like, why do we live here? (laughs) Right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a truer home built by God where you and I will be in eternal fellowship with him and one another as it was intended in the garden. So in the city for the city, it is not a vision that is restricted to the now. It also is in a biblical scriptural sense. It is the vision of the future city of God coming to earth. And there's an articulation of that in the book of Revelation, and I want to read it to you. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. It's a beautiful picture. It is the culmination of God's redemptive plan. And I think too many of us, we think that the story of God and us ends 
with us being whisked away to an eternal vacation in the sky. Like, I want to go to heaven. That's what, I'm going to tell you, the biblical description of eternity, of heaven, is not you and I floating off into heaven. It is heaven invading earth. It is God's goodness and glory being on the earth in its fullness and you and I being present in that. Some of you are like, what? (laughs) Yeah, we aren't going anywhere. Heaven is here in part. And this new city, this garden city, if you will, it's described in scripture as in a couple different frames. It's described as a new heaven and a new earth. Not a different earth, but a new, a completely renewed and renovated earth. The tree of life is described as being here, reminiscent of Genesis pre-fall language. Wait a second, connecting dots. It's described as, that garden city is described as no more death, sorrow, crying, or pain. As a crier, I'm kind of bummed about that. <laughs> like, like, well, sometimes it's just so pretty. But man, like those are death, sorrow, crying, and pain. They're typically symptoms of something. If the symptoms are gone, the cause is gone too. Scripture says that they will reign with God, meaning you and I, image bearers, co-rulers with God, working the ground, working creation, resting, eating, drinking. We will rule. And there will be no more like uh, pettiness. No more infighting. And then it says, God himself will be with them. That garden city is an unstoppable, insurmountable, unquenchable, and overwhelming goodness of God on the earth. We taste it in part right now. We're just eating appetizers. We can smell what's being cooked. It's only in part. And there will be a day when the kingdom of God is not just here in part, but in its fullness. Sign me up for that, you feel me? Like, let's go. So we're in the city for the city, here and now. We're planted in Spokane, but we're aimed at heaven is what that vision statement means. Planted here on purpose, for a purpose, and aimed at heaven. Because if we're just existing for the now, we're gonna be catastrophically let down. So how we deal with the disappointment and the brokenness and the hurt and the suffering that we encounter now is we, our hope is anchored in heaven. It's both here and and then. So who are we? Some is in the city for the city. We aren't stuck here, we're planted. Um, I mentioned that I was gonna talk to you about a five-year-old on top of a refrigerator because that's how we're gonna talk about mission. Uh, As a dad, I get to ask some pretty incredible questions from time to time. My personal favorite is, what are you doing? (laughs) Hey, what are you doing? I don't know, solid. Why are you doing it? I don't know, okay. Literally come around the corner. Ada, why are you on the fridge? I don't know. Okay, how about you get down? I don't want to. Okay, well, if you don't know why you're up there, I'm going to just ask you to get down, okay? If you could have given me some rational explanation, but you can't, so dad wins, get off the fridge. It is so important, not just for kids, but also for you and I, that we have purpose, that we understand our mission and the assignment before us. Because if we are just purposelessness, purposelessness, if we are without purpose, if we have no 
clarity on the assignment or the mission, just like my five-year-old, we are going to do weird stuff like stand on top of refrigerators and have no idea why we're doing it. Now, you might not stand on top of a refrigerator, but you're, you and I are capable of, of just wandering into nothingness. And then when it's like, hey, what are you doing? I don't know. Why are you doing it? Eh. Because you had no purpose. And it's not just a, an issue in young people. I think that that is a, a, I think that's a distortion of the truth. Yes, young people struggle with purpose, but it's, it's, not, it's not restricted to just young people. All of us will struggle with our purpose from time to time. Did you know that God has given you clarity in your purpose, in your assignment, in your mission? Every one of us. And you might have unique secondary assignments that God has given to you, but all of us as apprentices of Jesus, we share a singular mission. So the mission of Summit is not unique to Summit. We didn't dream it up on our own. It's not something we cooked up to be relevant. It has been passed on to us from generation to generation to generation. And if you follow the, the, the line of that mission being passed on, it has its origin and its genesis in the person of Jesus. Our mission is really simple. It's that we are disciples who make disciples. If you and I interact with me here for a moment, what's your favorite park in Spokane? Manitou? That's it? We're just man. Okay, no, that's great. It's a great park. Sorry, I don't. Riverside, Comstock, Mirabu. That's a dope park. Yeah, respect. Riverfront. I've never heard of that one. I'm just kidding. But I want you to just imagine this. You, you and me are on a walk with Jesus. Just you, me, and Jesus hanging out. Jesus probably has like a, a waffle cone from the scoop because he's a big ice cream guy, I guess. And we bump into someone at your favorite park, someone that you know really well, and they look at you like I looked at Ada that day and they go, what are you doing? You and I don't need to make up our own purpose. We simply get to point to Jesus and just say, we're with him. And one of the things that gets in the way of a lot of people's sense of peace and clarity is they think that they need to come up with their own purpose in life. It, it, it ruins people. I just, I don't I have a sense of purpose. What if I told you that you are filled with glorious purpose that Jesus has passed on to you? What if you stepped into that? And it's in Matthew chapter 28 and it's clear as day that you and I are called to be disciples who make disciples. Would you say that with me? Disciples who make disciples. This is, this is how it's articulated, the Great Commission. If you struggle with purpose in life, I commission you to memorize the Great Commission. Chew this thing over, turn it over in your mind and your heart. None of us are, are, should be with, without clarity of purpose. And when you forget, or when you're trying to make major life decisions, does it fit into your life mission as an apprentice of Jesus? This is how Matthew articulates the Great Commission. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Each of us, no matter how long or how short we've been following Jesus, no matter how much or how little we know, all of us have been called by Jesus to A, be a disciple and B, make disciples. So I wanna ask you a question, in love, there is no guilt or shame in me asking you this question. If you experience it, it's from Satan, not from Jesus. I wanna ask you a really sober question. Who are you discipling? 
The discipleship deficit in the church isn't someone else's problem, it's our problem. If we are not apprenticing under the teachings of Jesus and helping other people follow Jesus, we are neglecting our purpose and we are just playing church. I don't wanna play church with you. I'd rather play golf with you. Our purpose, our assignment, our mission is to be a disciple. Do we even know what that is? Who are you discipling? Or maybe let me ask you this, who's discipling you? I've been in this church for 10 years. I've never had anyone walk up to me and say, hey, could I disciple you? I've never had anybody walk up to me and say, hey, will you disciple me? That's just fact. It's not a shot at anybody. And we are not the only church in America that has a discipleship deficit. So what do we do? I will tell you, in my experience, nine times out of 10, the next faith step as a disciple it is almost always discovered in a meaningful conversation with another person. A meaningful conversation with another person. What does that look like? Maybe it's a conversation with someone to say, what is a disciple? Maybe it's a conversation to say, what am I good at? How can I serve other people? Where can I help with my spiritual gifts? We have a collective mission and an assignment. And I'll tell you this in my experience as well, God will do all the heavy lifting, we just have to play our part. If we heap the pressure of getting out of the discipleship deficit on ourselves, it is a crushing weight. Because I can't change you and you can't change me. But God will do the heavy lifting of the soul, changing the desires of the heart. Another aspect of discipleship that I think causes us to stay at arm's distance away from it is that we think we need to, like we're afraid of messing up. I don't wanna mess out someone's life up. I don't wanna, I don't wanna ruin someone else's Jesus stuff, right? Am I the only person that's like, you're just asking me to help spiritually form someone? I don't want, I can't even do my laundry. But I will tell you this. Discipling other people is not about you being successful, it's about you being faithful. And a lot of us suffer from what I would call Amazon Prime spirituality. We want fruit and results and we want it tomorrow. What if I told you that you, you and I cultivated the soil of relationship with another person for decades and saw no fruit, would you still do it? Discipleship looks more like this Faithful, 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 fruit. Faithful, 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 fruit. We want fruit, 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 fruit. That's a lie. Like, just straight up. That's not, that's, that's, that's not reality. You don't have to be afraid of being successful. You can just be faithful with what's in front of you. Like, are are you, and I think another thing, I'll say this about discipleship and I need to keep going because I'm on a rabbit trail. When I step towards you 
and say, hey, let me help disciple you. I don't, I don't think it's arrogant. And some of you do. Some of you are like, ah, I don't, that just sounds arrogant. I could never step towards someone and say, hey, could I just disciple you? Because it's presumptuous, right? It's saying, I'm, I'm so advanced in this Jesus stuff. Let me educate you, peasant. But I'll tell you straight up, it takes a lot of humility to step towards someone and say, hey, could I help you follow Jesus? And then as we do that, if I can see my friend Bo over here. Bo is, a, Bo is a unique man. He's different than me. If I step towards Bo and say, hey, Bo, let me help you follow Jesus. Let's do this together. The goal is not Bo being more like Grant. The goal is me and Bo being more like Jesus together. I'm going to learn a lot from him and he's going to learn a lot from me. It's not presumptuous if I'm a couple steps ahead of him in this thing called practicing the way of Jesus to step toward him and say, hey, let me help you. And one way, it's always reciprocal. I cannot tell you anybody that I've actively discipled who hasn't actively discipled me right back because it's Christ in them, the hope of glory shaping me. It's a both and thing. But I'm gonna tell you right now, we all have to step toward that together. That is not some of our responsibility, it's all of ours. We aren't waiting on a couple superstars to come in and disciple the church. It is ordinary women and men like you and me being faithful. That's how we work ourselves toward health in this discipleship deficit. It's gonna be messy. <laughs> we're gonna mess up, we're gonna make mistakes. It's not gonna be perfect, but that's okay. And if right now you're like, dude, I just, I, I'm, you're overwhelming me. That is not my intention. Remember, it starts with a meaningful conversation. And I'm going to tell you a prayer that I prayed this morning. Uh, I prayed that, that there would be such a, a, such a stack of connect cards this week that our whole staff has to delay every project they're working on for two months. And I'm not joking you, because forever at Summit, people are gonna be a priority over programs and projects. Like, I just, I want, like, this is what I, this is my hope. This, this high. And at staff meeting on Tuesday, hey guys, here's 20 names of people with phone numbers. We're gonna move the budget around and we're gonna eat a lot of lunches, dinners, breakfasts, and cups of coffee. And we're gonna have really meaningful questions and we're gonna ask good conversations. And we're gonna go in there and help people discover what the Holy Spirit is already doing in their lives and help them take their next faith step. Come on. Every project can wait. <laughs> So if you're like, I don't know what my next faith step is, or I would just love to have a conversation with someone, I want to really invite you to fill one of these babies out. Because you don't have to figure this out on your own. <laughs> this isn't a Lone Ranger thing. This is us following Jesus together. And the staff doesn't have all of the answers. We aren't the accomplished Christians in the room. We are the ones who are called by Jesus to serve this faith community, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Part of the discipleship deficit has been caused by us professionalizing following Jesus and waiting for the professionals to do everything. That ain't it. This is us. This is ordinary women and men like you and I taking faith step after faith step after faith step. So who are we? We are disciples who make disciples. And the last thing I told you is, uh, I wanna talk about values now for a minute. And I told you that I was gonna talk about these glasses, a five-year-old standing on top of a refrigerator. And does anybody remember the third thing? <laughs> you listened! And I'm not just incoherent bam babbling, bambling up here. <laughs> cucumber vinegar salad. How many of you hate cucumber vinegar salad? Be honest. Yeah, okay. And you hate it, you hate it. Who likes it? Who's like, you give me all that? Yeah. You're like, I want canker sores all over my mouth. 
I remember I was in fifth grade. I was in fifth grade. I got out of school. I went over to a buddy's house and we were, we were being fifth grade boys, throwing rocks through windows and just dumb stuff. Now uh, that's what I did as a fifth grade boy. I'm sure your fifth grade boy is way better. But we were playing and then my buddy's dad is like, hey, come here. And he, they had a garden in their backyard. And he was like, come over here. And he's like, uh, we're gonna make cucumber vinegar salad together just as a little snack. It wasn't dinner time. It was just, it was kind of hot out and it can be kind of refreshing. You throw like an ice cube in it. It's like a little bit, I don't know. That's what they did. So we were like looking at me like, what are you talking about? But we like get the, we get the we onion, the cucumbers, and we go into the house and we're making it and we're just talking, chatting it up. And then uh, my buddy and I get our bowls and we go sit at the table and his dad was still standing in the corner of the kitchen. And uh, I just sat down at the table and I did what I had done I mean, with almost every meal I ever ate. And I just, I just bowed my head and I just said, Jesus, thank you for this, this fresh vegetables that you provided. And thank you that I get to be over here playing after school. Amen. And when I said amen, I just hear, <laughs> and it was my buddy's dad. And I turn over to the counter and he just, he leans forward and he goes, hey, Grant, not in this house. And it was the first time in my life where the values of the home that I was living in were not reflected in the values of another home that I was in. I, up until that point, I thought that every human being on the face of the earth when they sat down to eat told God thanks for providing the food. It was like a shock to my system. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, and I'm like, and then that, that was the first time I encountered someone who actively was opposed to Jesus. Because he was like, do you actually believe that crap or stuff? Mm, sorry. <laughs> Send your email to nick at summitsocan.com. <laughs> but he, I just remember this dad and he kind of like went in on me a little bit. But that phrase, like... Do you, I don't know if, you, if there's some phrases from your childhood, like some of them are good and life-giving that are stuck in your memory bank and some of them are not great and they're like actively unhelpful. And that phrase, not in this house, it's like stuck in my head. I mean, that was, I was in fifth grade, I'm 36 years old now and I still think about it. But I'm aware of different value systems and how my values integrate and also are like offensive to other people's. And what's the way of Jesus in differing value systems? <laughs> it's a challenging conversation to have. And I wanna just share the values of this house with you. And the thing about it is you might not have ever seen these statements before, but you've experienced the reality of them because the values of Summit shape the culture of Summit. We, we don't do anything unintentionally. We try to be intentional with everything that we do. And the values and the culture of Summit, it's not built on the opinions of some. The values are anchored in scripture. And I will tell you this, these six values, they are not exhaustive, but they are expansive. If, I want, if we wanted to build a list of like values that are true and reflected in scripture about the people of God, we would have tens of thousands of values. And I'm gonna tell you right now, like I can barely remember the six sometimes. And I don't wanna put that on you. So these aren't exhaustive values, but they're expansive, meaning that they roll out. They are far reaching. They integrate, I think, the whole counsel of God's people to varying degrees. So I'm just gonna rip through these and then we'll pray together, all right? So in this house, we value uh, grace changing everything. Meaning that the expectation on you isn't to be perfect. And when you mess up, what you can expect to be hit with is grace. It doesn't mean that sin isn't sin. It doesn't mean that we become so tolerant of sin that it's like, ah, whatever. He rose from the dead. No, like sin is very serious. It is crouching at your door waiting to have you is how it's described in scripture. 
but, but we believe that grace changes everything and that as grace changes everything, the grace of Jesus on your life, you get to be an extender of that same grace to others. And it's not just true of when we're gathered here, but also when we go out into the big, bad, scary world. We are to be people, agents of grace in the world. No one needs to be hit with shame and guilt and condemnation. Those are the tactics of Satan, not the kingdom of God. So grace changes everything. If we could somehow like, I don't know how we could materialize grace, like what periodic table of elements we would use. But if we just had buckets of grace, I would just, just throw it all over you all the time. And I don't know if it would be like a liquid or a sauce or what, but... I just, I think when, if you could have that mental image of like, what is God's heart towards me? Grace, patience, kindness, gentleness. He is gracious towards you. In this house, we value grace changing everything. Also in this house, we value the gospel at the center. We evaluate everything regularly. And when we put things on the the chopping block, the cutting board, if you will, is the gospel at the center of it or not? And I think it would be wise to ask yourself this question, do you have a working definition of the gospel? I think that's something that I'm being challenged with right now is that I need to do a better job of articulating the gospel more holistically. And I'm, you know, a good place to start, if, if someone asked you, just imagine this, imagine you leave here, whatever you got going on next, and someone walks up to you and says, hey, could you explain the gospel to me? I don't get it. You should be salivating as an apprentice of Jesus for that moment. Oh, let's go, baby. Well, tell me a little bit about you. Tell me your story. I want to get to know you so that I can tell the gospel in a way that is uniquely fit for how you're able to hear it right now. Because if I just respond, Jesus died on the cross to save you for your sins, it's a it's a good start, but if the gospel is just that, I think we've limited it. The gospel is robust, and something that the more seasoned saints in our church have taught me and shown me is that the gospel gets better the older you get. It doesn't get stale or crunchy or old. It has a freshness and a vitality to it. Do you preach the gospel to yourself with regularity? No one talks to you more than you, and it would probably be wise of you and I to speak the gospel over ourselves. Come on. In this house, we also value wells, not fences. Would you say that with me? Wells, not fences. This, is, uh, this comes out of John chapter 4 where uh, Jesus is having a conversation with a Samaritan woman. And he looks at her and says like one of the most savage things that Jesus ever says is he's like, I have water you know nothing about. She's just looking for some water to drink because she's thirsty. And he's like, no, I have a living water. <laughs> Meaning like that soul within you that aches, only I can quench that thirst. Pretty, pretty amazing statement. And, as, and the implications of us valuing wells, not fences, it has to do with us recognizing that everywhere we go throughout our weeks, everywhere we go, we are people who are actively digging wells for other people to come and experience the living water of Jesus. Like I'm not much of a farmer, but if you could just envision the metaphor of this being a, water from a deep well. When we gather and we worship and we pray and we fellowship together, as we go out from here, there are irrigation ditches being dug everywhere you go and the living water of Jesus is flowing in those spaces. And in that, we are not hyper-concerned with who's in or who's out. We want everyone to know the living water of Jesus. We want to have meaningful conversations. We want to be present with the people in this city. And so wells, not fences is like, let's be about what Jesus was about. 
Next value is, uh, in this house we value relent, uh, deeply formed people. Would you say that with me? Deeply formed people. I've talked quite a bit about that and we do a series with regularity on that. Um, that comes from John 15, where Jesus, uh, he uses the word abide or the Greek word meno multiple times in a short section. And he's essentially saying, don't compartmentalize your life allow me to take up residency in every aspect of who you are. And then he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Those are some of the, sometimes Jesus says stuff where I'm like, I don't prefer that, dude. I actually think I'm capable of some things apart from you. And we live like it all the time. Hey, I'm, Jesus, hold my coffee. I'm going to do this. He's like, no. Nah. How about we do that together? deeply formed people. We are constantly being formed. And are we being formed in Christ or deformed by the world? That's the question that we got to be attentive to with regularity. The next value, the thing we value in this house is relentless hospitality. Would you say that with me? Relentless hospitality. Um, The gospel can be articulated with words and it also can be demonstrated with action. And the vulgarity, the hostility, the quarreling. It's not even argumentation anymore. Like the world is just obsessed with quarreling. Adults acting like toddlers with each other. Argumentation is a good thing. Two adults thinking critically, having argumentation, conversing, respectfully hearing one another's differing opinions. But quarreling is just emotional ranting. And I will tell you right now that one of the most subversive ways for you and I to demonstrate the gospel to a world that is obsessed with quarreling and, and, and division and, and disrespect is to be hospitable. It is like, it is like fresh water on, a, on a, thirsty, a thirsty throat. To be a hospitable person to show the gospel through kindness and joy in serving someone else, to mindfully think ahead and say, man, what does this person need? And I'll tell you straight up, some of you have the spiritual gift of hospitality. You don't have to have the spiritual gift of hospitality to live into hospitality. It's like, I I don't do that. Mm -mm. Okay. Well, Jesus regularly walked in hospitality towards others. And the way of Jesus is the way of hospitality, relentlessly. And then the last value is community. We don't believe that anybody should be going at this thing alone. We believe scripture is very clear that we are better together, that we are a body, that we are a family, that we are called to responsibility to one another. Community, gospel community is a big, big deal in this house. So in this house, that's what we value. And this list, like I said, it is not exhaustive, but we believe that together it is expansive and it's aligned with the way of Jesus. Could there be more? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) But I'll tell you straight up, like uh, Pastor Nick, our executive pastor, he'll once in a while, like he'll just catch me when I'm not ready and he'll be like, hey, what are the values? And I'm like, uh, and he's like, you are the lead pastor of this church. You need to know the mission, the vision, the values. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to like hold you to this, but I think it's important that we're aware of who we are. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Summit is not a, ch- a perfect church filled with perfect people, right? We are a glorious mess. Amen, church. But we are a mess that we believe that God has things in store for. Um, We are in the city for the city. We're focused on Spokane, aimed at heaven. We are disciples who make disciples. And we are a people with a set of values that shape the culture in the way that we treat each other. May we be women and men who are in the city for the city. May we be disciples, apprentices of Jesus, And may we be discipling actively other people. And may we be a people who live out the values of this church, not just within the walls of this church. Amen, Summit? Amen. Amen. We love you so much. Have a good week, everybody. It was good to be with you at Church Online this morning. 
My prayer is that you met Jesus in a personal and meaningful way. If there's something particular that drew your heart a little closer to Him, we'd like to do what we can to make that more integral to your life. I'd like to suggest a few possible next steps for you. Connecting to a community group is one of the most helpful ways to strengthen your walk with Jesus. Another really meaningful step is baptism. Maybe you're feeling like you need some specific prayer. Possibly you're ready to step into serving here at Summit in some way. If you'll take a minute and complete an online connect card, a member of our team will contact you this week to continue that conversation. One option would be to listen to today's message again or one of the previous messages. They're all easily available online for you. As I mentioned already, we're highly committed to doing life together. We're convinced that being in community with others is the best way to keep your faith viable and strong. If you're local to Spokane, I want to invite you to join us here in person. If you've loved being a part of Summit Online, but you're not local, I encourage you to connect with a church family that's near you. Find a life-giving relationship with others. We love you. We pray that you have a great week in the Lord.